Living in the 11th and 12th centuries, it was not surprising for a Seljuk Turk of the elite class to wake up in the morning to find a dagger lodged in the floor next to his bed, despite the massive castle walls, tightly locked iron gates and fully equipped guards, someone had somehow entered the room and left a note with the dagger. Do as we say or next time it will be your heart where the dagger is lodged, although in some cases the dagger reached its target without any warning. The earliest records of the Hashishins were kept by Vilarmus Tyrensis, a priest of French origin living in Syria. Vilarmus wrote that this formation, which held many fortresses in their hands, was called Hashishins by both the Latins and the Arabs, and that no one knows where this name came from. The word assassin, as he noted in Western languages and today it has inspired popular culture products such as Assassin's Creed. Although Hassan Saba was at the center of the legendary narratives produced in the Middle East in the 11th and 12th centuries, he would only achieve such fame in Europe from 1298 onwards. In this year, Rusticello would also publish the travels of Marco Polo, with whom he had been imprisoned in Pisa Geneva, in a book. The depiction of Hassan Saba, which the Venetian traveler shaped with literary embellishments, actually referred to the image of paradise in the East, which had remained vivid in the minds of Europeans throughout the Crusades. The lines written by Marco Polo about Hassan Saba also clarify the price to be paid on this road to paradise there was a garden of paradise that Hassan had carefully prepared inside the Alamut castle, where he was the ruler of the Alamut castle, the largest and most beautiful garden in this world. One of the rivers flowing softly in the colorful trees throws water from one, honey from another, and wine from another, and the surroundings are full of beautiful young girls. And left here, everything is so perfect that when the young man wakes up, he thinks that he is in a dream. The false paradise that Hassan has created has almost overwhelmed his mind, but there is an end to this. After a few days, the young man drinks the same mixture again and moves in with Hassan. There is only one thing, to fulfill Hassan's request, even if he dies while doing this, he is told that he will still go to the promised paradise, and the bouncer, who is almost burning with the desire to return to this false paradise that he cannot even get out of his mind, becomes ready to do whatever is asked of him, including killing someone without blinking an eye. Marco Polo portrays Hassan Saba as a clever, ambitious, and vengeful figure who gets what he wants no matter what, he is in the position of a charismatic, even supernatural leader who holds paradise in the palm of his hand and promises it to his men when necessary in addition. Some of today's historians tend to regard Hassan Saba's bouncers as a death machine working in a planned and programmed way. This approach suggests that the Valley of Paradise is only symbolic and that there is no Garden of Paradise in Alamut Castle. Hassan Saba was born in 1046 or 1053 in the Iranian city of Qam which was then, as now, a holy city for Shiite Muslims. It was also one of the leading centers of education in the Islamic world in Iran, but Hassan would receive most of his education in the city of Rei, where his family would later emigrate, according to his father's beliefs. At the age of seven, Hassan was interested in scientific subjects. In particular, he wanted to become a religious scholar, so his family settled in the city of Rei, which from the 10th century onwards had become an important center of activity for teachers called geniuses, so that he could continue his studies there. Until the age of 17, he remained loyal to the imam to which his family belonged, but one day he met a conquering genius named Amir Zurab, who would change Saba's life forever. Zurab's speeches had such an effect on him that the young man was immediately drawn to another branch of Shiism, Ismaili sect and swore allegiance to Al-Mustansir, the Fatimid Caliph of the time. Another of the events that determined the fate of Hassan Saba. In 1072 he crossed paths with Ibn Akhtash, the chief genius of Iraq, who had taken a close interest in Saba and immediately realized what a clever and talented man he was. The only thing to do now was to direct Hassan's ambitions and desires in the right direction. Some important sources of the period claim that he met with the caliph and was received very favorably and was even appointed as the deputy of the caliph of Khorasan, whereas other sources state that no such meeting ever took place whatever the case, in these years Hassan had already entered into the sequence of events that would turn him into the future leader of all the Nazaris. 
Hassan Saba supported Nizar, who was appointed heir apparent to the caliphate after al-Mustansir, while the most powerful figure in the Fatimid world, the vizier Bedr Ali Jamali, supported Nizar, who was appointed heir apparent to the caliphate after al-Mustansir, for this reason, Jamali first imprisoned Hassan Saba, who opposed him on this issue, and then expelled him from the country. According to another narration, Hassan found a way to escape from prison and left Egypt on a ship from Alexandria and reached Isfahan on 10 June 1081. In the following years, Hassan Saba would make long trips covering the whole of Iran, carrying with him the words of the Nazaris of Kerman, although his words were respected in regions such as Yes and Husasistan but he could not find many supporters, so he turned his attention to the north of Iran and the shores of the Caspian Sea, he turned his attention to the mountainous regions of Dilem and Mazemdaran, where Hassan worked for three years, devoting his greatest efforts to this region, which was heavily influenced by the Shiite Ismaili propaganda, and succeeded in attracting the mountain warriors to his side. In the meantime, he was also winning the local people with the geniuses he sent, but his activities were constantly monitored. The Seljuk vizier Nizamulmulk received alarming reports about Saba's activities in the region every day. Eventually, he ordered his officials to capture him, but Hassan managed to elude them and reached Kazvin. He was now a powerful man whose popular map had increased. He finally settled in the legendary Alamut Castle, which he chose as his headquarters in the Rugbar Valley, and founded the Nazari Ismaili state on 4 September 1090. The fortifications he built were extraordinary, Alamut, which was already strong enough in terms of its position, was transformed into an impregnable mountain. He built warehouses where food could be stored for a long time without spoiling so that the castle could withstand long-term sieges, and from this inaccessible castle, which he used as a military headquarters, he began to manage the operations he organized. Hassan's most striking feature was his sharp intelligence, which was noticed at first glance. Although he was sure, he knew that their numbers were insufficient, he needed a huge army to resist the Seljuks at the peak of their power. However, he did not intend to show himself on the battlefield. After settling in Alamut, he first started to increase his supporters in the region, and his effective oratory skills were of great benefit to him. Thus, in a short time, he was able to create a network covering the castles in the Grubber region, including Alamut. The geniuses he sent to the region organized the Shiites living in the region and helped them to revolt against the Seljuks. The chaotic environment created would help Hassan to gain influence in this region. Soon many fortresses came under his rule. Thus, the Nazari Ismaili state established by Hassan started to grow in the middle of the Seljuk Sultanate within about a year, and this situation caused him to attract all the attention. In 1092, the attacks launched by Nizamulmulk turned the regions in Hassan's hands into hell, but Hassan's strategy immediately showed how effective it was. The strong fortresses, which could be easily defended with a small number of garrisons, repulsed the Seljuk attacks one after another, moreover, Hassan's response to these attacks would be quite clear. Towards the middle of October 1092, a large caravan, including Sultan Meliksa and Nizamulmulk, set off from Isfahan towards Baghdad. However, they were unaware that the footsteps of death were following them while they were staying in a village called Sunni. A man named Abu Tahir Irani was admitted to the vizier's presence because he had a complaint. During the meeting, Irani took out the poisonous knife hidden behind his clothes and killed the vizier. In a few seconds, he would share the same fate himself. Some medieval writers, who attributed Hassan Saba's anger against the Seljuks to a personal incident, wrote that he was a classmate of Nizam al-Mulk. According to the story, both friends were highly ambitious and intelligent. This event will eventually turn the patient into a vengeful person, a ruthless enemy who does not hesitate to shed blood, or at least the traditional historiography, which was the monopoly of the Seljuks at that time, will imprison him in this mold. But today we know that this story is not true, some of the sources that vilify him have caused another truth about the duo to reach our day. Nizamulmulk is about 30 years older than Hassan Saba, this fact shows that he was much more than a vengeful traitor. Shortly after the death of Nizamulmulk, Sultan Meliksa also died.
After the death of Sultan Malik Shah, Hassan Saba took advantage of the chaotic atmosphere created by the throne fights between the members of the dynasty and the occupation of some Seljuk lands by the Crusaders and expanded his sphere of dominance. At 1102 Hassan Saba captured some strategically important fortresses. In addition to this, he kept the main centers of the Seljuk state under pressure through propaganda. During the struggle between Burk Yarik and Muhammad Tapar, his men infiltrated Burk Yaruk's army and tried to increase their influence in the army. The Seljuk Sultan Muhammad Tapar showed the most effective struggle against Hassan, who captured the fortress of Shahis, which was of vital importance due to its strategic location, and the Sultan besieged Alamut twice in 1109 and 1117 but failed to capture it. In this period, edicts were issued against the Nazaris, and it was decided to kill those who proved to be Hassan Saba's supporters. However, this initiative caused people to report people they did not like as Nazaris, so no one was involved in the events. The last years of Hassan Saba's life are hidden behind the foggy curtain of history, the most important reason for this is related to the hermitage he retreated in Alamut during these years. His death in 1124 was thought between the stone walls of this huge residence, and he calculated transferring his written heritage to future generations in a healthy way.